The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello and welcome to the American Veteran. I'm Dale Parrish, your host, and my co-host this evening is Carl Fowler. Before I introduce my, our guest, uh, Carl would like to tell about an experience that uh, we had a couple of weeks ago. Carl? Uh, good evening. Uh, on Friday, September 9th, Black Hawk Middle School had a commemorative gathering at their gymnasium. The Korean War Vets Chapter 1 were honored to be invited to participate, along with Air Guard personnel, Mayor Tom Henry, City and County Police, Fire Chief, EMS, Homeland Security, and other first responders. The Honor Guard posted the colors. The sixth, seventh, and eighth grade student winners of the 9-11 essays were recognized, and I was chosen to respond to the seventh grade winner. It was quite an honor to be among such servers of our country. Us vets see 9-11 as another type of warfare, not just terrorism, war. The enemy knows they cannot beat us, on the, beat us at conventional warfare on the battlefield. So terrorism, their tactic, hit, run, and hide. America will and must honor our troops for the tough and dangerous job they do. And always remember, freedom is not free, only because our service members have, and are even now, paying that price for us. I am proud to be an American. Stay safe, thank you, and good evening. Thank you, Carl. I sure appreciated that, uh, that program that we had a good time out yeah, there. Yeah. We've been out to Black Hawk, what, about six times or yeah, so. Yeah. And uh, they always treat us with the utmost respect. And uh, we respect the job that they do the in kids, teaching the students. Yeah, you know? the kids are enthusiastic and patriotic. Yes, if all the kids so. are like that, we, this country has nothing to worry about. Right. We, <laughs> we said the Pledge of Allegiance and so forth. They're, they're all into it real yeah, well. Yeah. Our guest this evening is John Zimmerman. Uh, he was on a previous program. He's a Korean uh, War veteran, Vietnam War veteran. He achieved the rank of Master Sergeant. He has two uh, Bronze Stars for Valor, Purple Heart, among others. Uh, the other program we talked about uh, his experience in Korea. This program we'd like to talk to him about uh, Vietnam or from Korea on, whatever. Vietnam was an entirely different war than what Korea was. Uh, for one thing, I had uh, been in Korea as an artillery forward observer. Uh, I went into the infantry, stayed a period of time in the infantry. And then I decided I wanted to try aviation out. Aviation, in my opinion, had saved a lot of our lives when I was in Korea with close air support. So I wanted to give, try that and see how they operated. So I went to Vietnam and, and uh, worked on a A-4 Douglas Skyhawk. Uh, it was a close air support aircraft. Uh, it was used to uh, fire rockets, bombs, napalm, smoke bombs, about anything that, that they could carry underneath one of them. Uh, it was a small aircraft. The pilots referred to it as a scooter because it was short-winged and was very maneuverable. Uh, I went to Chulai, which was uh, 
on the, I think it was, remember it was on the West Coast. Uh, at Chulai we had uh, the A-4, the Phantom, uh, other various types. The Air Force was also on there and the Army was also at this base. But our basic mission was, uh, we had 20 A-4 aircraft and our basic mission was to furnish close air support for the infantry as I had seen it done in Korea. Uh, the loads that we put under the aircraft varied from bombs to napalm, whatever, whatever the target type of targets they was going to attack. Uh, we flew our missions in the daytime, uh, 40, 50, 60, 75, dependent on sorties, which is one hop. Uh, the pilots would uh, fly the aircraft to go out to targets and uh, use whatever ordnance that they had. They would come back, uh, the aircraft would be refueled, uh, rearmed, and uh, pre-flighted by the plane captain and, and ready to fly again. That was our basic mission, was close air support for the ground troops. Yeah. Those planes have a, a long range or was a pretty short range? Well, they could go a long way because it could be in-flight refueling. It had an in-flight refueling probe on top of it. Uh, and uh, we could be refueled by a, a large refueling aircraft or we had the capability to refuel our own aircraft, what we called a buddy tank. Uh, one of our tanks, it would be a 300 tank, gallon tank, would be put underneath the aircraft. He would go up and he would let the drogue go out in the back of it just like the refueling tankers do and he could refuel only 300 gallons or some fuel out of his own aircraft he could transfer to that tank mm -hmm. but we had the capability which we didn't use our our missions were all close mm -hmm. so the planes were stationed up closer to the front lines yes they were yeah july was close uh we flew a lot a lot of missions uh, quite a ways off but always within our, our fuel capabilities. When that plane come back after a first mission and is ready for a second mission, the same pilot take it or uh, uh, change pilots? Probably would change pilots. Uh, for the second mission. Uh, and they would come back. I've seen pilots come back with, uh, uh, for instance, one pilot come in and I found uh, green tree limbs stuck <laughs> in different places. Uh, that's what called and on the he, deck. <laughs> he had been down on the deck close, close, very close. <laughs> well, I had uh, one aircraft that made an attack on, a, and he come back, and he flew right through the roof of a of a, of a North Vietnamese hut, and brought back part of it. His airplane was so banged up and damaged that uh, we could never fly it again. It had to be barged out of the country because he had banged yeah. it up so bad it was incapable of flying. I don't even know how he got the plane back, but he got it back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he, did. yeah. Uh, when, when was you in Vietnam? 1968-1969. The first thing I seen when I got there, I started thinking back to Korea. I seen weapons used there at, at that time that I wish we'd have had in Korea. Uh, the Gatling gun. Uh, the yeah. first time I seen a helicopter file a Gatling gun out, out, the, out the door, you would see the solid red from the door to the ground. It, uh, just solid red. That's how many. That many ammo. bullets going at one that time. That there was a lot of bullets going at one time. Yeah. And yes. if you take a garden hose <clears throat> and you take a garden hose and you do this with it, you see how the water does. Well, that's the way they would do. They would we they would make it weave, and it, that's the way it would come down on the ground. Look like red water coming down on the ground. Cover more area. And then the, another aircraft that we had, I seen in action was Spooky the gunship. It would be a uh, probably a KC-134 inch in turboprop, uh, and it would have uh, 40 millimeters out the side of it. It would have 105s out the side of it. It would have Gatling guns out the side of it. And when they fired in a bank, when the airplane was in a bank, that's when they would pick their target. This is all like all done inside the aircraft electronically to pick mm -hmm. the target and do everything with it. But you talk about firepower, it was like a Fourth of July when I seen the first one fire. Mm -hmm. I had a mountain. Uh, I worked nights. Being the combat that I had had in Korea, things always happen at night. So I knew that I was not going to be asleep at night. I was right. going to be awakened on the job. So I worked night shift from 12 in the morning till, uh, or 12 in the evening to 12 in the, six, six to six, I'd work. Because all the action was, was going to, uh, any attack was going to be in the, in the nighttime, not in the daytime. They didn't want to present themselves as targets, did no, they? No, they did not. Uh, there was a mountain off in the distance that I used to watch, and it was like watching a movie. 
the army was on top of the mountain. They had they they stayed there, had a permanent base there, and I used to sit there at night, like watching the movie, and watch the Viet Cong as they advance up that hill, because you could tell where everybody's at by the firepower, tracers the, and that. tracers and stuff. You could tell where the lines was. Us. This is, was about an every night affair. This went on, but it was like mm -hmm. watching a TV movie to watch them go up and down that thing at night. And that's when I seen the gunships and the helicopters mm -hmm. doing their thing. Mm -hmm. But Chulai was. Uh, it was a Marston matting was uh, most of it, and then we had the cement runway. Uh, I had the occasion to witness something that I would have never believed if I hadn't seen it. Uh, an F-4 Phantom is, uh, is a pilot in the, in the second seat. Uh, I don't, can't remember what he was called. But the Phantom is, uh, has two J-75 engines with afterburners on them. Uh, he had had his hydraulic system shot out and he was coming into what we call the Morris gear. Now the Morris gear is a cable across the runway that he drops the tail hook on and connects onto it. And when he goes down, it it slows him down and stops him, kind of like aircraft aircraft carrier. Aircraft carrier. Yes. Uh, he was heavy, and he couldn't get his landing gear down because his hydraulic system was shot out. And uh, he come down, he belly landed, and he had his tail hook down. And when he went across the cable, he was going too fast and he ripped the cable out. And he was sliding on his belly along the runway. And I figured that I, I kept saying to myself, get out, get out, get out. And all of a sudden, I hear this boom, boom. And he kicked it into afterburner. And after going all the way down the runway on his belly, he actually lifted the airplane back up into the air from his belly and flew out over the go over the water and both of them bailed out and both of them was all right. I couldn't <laughs> believe an airplane. I mean, I knew a lot about aircraft. I, I was in awe that this airplane had that kind of power. It was after, it. afterburners or something else. He probably did that because he knew the plane was gone, right? He, he had and to get out. If he, he was almost to the end of the runway and that was going to be it because he was up, he was going to run out and in out into the sand and he was just he was in trouble. He's going to plane could explode on him and everything else. He had to be one cool cool person. That's all I know to do that. An afterburner in an aircraft uh, is a round fuel tube right back by the end. It goes around. It's round and all it does is shoot raw fuel out into the system. Right. And when he hits that afterburner, he throws the fuel out in there and then the rest of the engine in the rear ignites that, and that's why you hear this big boom. I, if you take gas and throw it into a barrel, and then you throw oh, it, we got stuff in there, you throw it, you go, boom, out comes out. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what like happens. After burn yeah. works. Sure. A c c controlled explosion. Yep. Well, that's yeah. exactly. exactly right. But that, uh, that airplane was so powerful, I just didn't think an airplane had enough power to slide that way on his belly and then, yeah. then uh, and lift back up and that, fly again. That was not the heaviest aircraft, but it was one of the heaviest fighters yes. we've ever come up with. And that thing was capable of going straight up. It was uh, it was a very powerful airplane because yeah. it had two J-75s. And that was the two J-75s, a big engine. All right. So didn't you, uh, wasn't you telling about an explosion or uh, something setting off a, a, a rocket on on deck or? Uh, that was one morning, uh, about 6.30 in the morning, uh, the VC fired one rocket in. And it didn't hit my squadron, but it hit the squadron next to us. Uh, it hit their bomb dump. And Ooh. naturally things started happening. Uh, it set off an aircraft on fire. Now all in the morning, that time in the morning, all your airplanes are loaded. Uh, there was 10 airplanes sitting in revetments with 12 250-pound bombs hanging under each one of them, plus 810 gallons of internal fuel loaded mm -hmm. in each one of them, which means if it goes, it go, it's, it's going to be a big bang. Uh, what was happening was that the, now the revetments are steel plated with sand in between. You have a steel plate, you have sand, and you have another steel uh, plate in there, and the airplanes are backed into these revetments for safety. It's, it's uh, almost like a garage or yes. something. It's got sides in the back. Right. And the floor is that. cement. The floor would be uh, would be yeah. cement. The front would be open, and then over the top of it would just be a roof, a tin roof to keep the uh, sun off the aircraft. So what, it's what like was, a bulletproof garage that right. you parked in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was happening is the aircraft was uh, one would catch on fire and blow up, and it would start come the down and one. start the next one on fire, and they were leapfrogging. Uh, we tried to, uh, we did save one aircraft, 
by hand, we hand pushing it. Uh, aircraft with 810 gallon of fuel and 12, 250 pound bombs is pretty heavy. Uh, we were trying to hand push one out. And while we were pushing it out, uh, unknowns to us, this airplane next to us was on fire and it blew. And we were probably 40 feet from it when it blew. I've never heard an explosion like that. Never bombs were flying off, flying along on the ground like bowling balls. Uh, the air parts were flying all over. The only thing that kept us from getting totally obliterated by it was the explosion went out the front and we were off at the side a little bit. Okay. So the force of the explosion went straight out the front. Because that was open. The only thing we got was concussion. It threw us into the air and slammed us back down on the ground. Uh, but we did stop the fire from going any further because we stopped the next aircraft from, from coming out of it. Didn't leapfrog but over. But that one, one rocket sure did a lot of damage. <laughs> I can imagine. Probably couldn't hear for a while either. <laughs> no, I still, I have a hearing problem. In fact, my ear rings, tendonitis rings 24 hours a day, seven days yeah, a week because yeah. of that explosion. Yeah. It was, uh, I went up in the air and came down on the ground and, and, and I had a concussion and several other problems from it. Uh, but it was could have been a lot worse because that thing where we'd have been out in front. We might not have survived. We never would have survived. Yeah. No way. Right. No way. A 250-pound bomb flying along the ground hits you. You're done. Yep. Is this so? Uh, where you said you couldn't wear a hat because it was getting sucked into the you couldn't, intake. Uh, jet aircraft, uh, they'll suck you right in. Yeah. Uh, because uh, they're using a tremendous amount of air. And uh, you could not wear a hat, you could not wear a rag. Uh, the ground around the aircraft had to be always policed up. And what I mean, everything around you had, first thing you did every morning was walk the flight line and pick up any debris we called FOD. And because uh, it would suck it into the engine. Uh, a bird goes through an engine, the engine's destroyed. Yeah. And a rag will destroy an engine. So you could wear no hat, you couldn't, uh, and you had to be very careful around a high power run up. Uh, you couldn't uh, walk up the ladder to talk to the pilot because of uh, it would it would suck you right in. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. a lot of a lot of people got hurt that way. You stayed away from the front end. Of Always the jet engine. Always engine. yes. Mm -hmm. But you have took all the beating from the sun. A lot of the the, the sun was uh, didn't bother me. The guys worked days. It did, but. Since I worked nights, oh. I didn't. I didn't have to. wasn't too concerned about uh, okay. about the sun at all. Uh, it was pretty qu quiet around at night because uh, our main job was repairing the aircraft and getting the aircraft ready to launch the next day. Yeah. Put get them out on their missions. I knew the importance of these aircraft because I had received close air support from my time in Korea. So I knew that uh, it was important that these airplane. Uh, be ready to go the next morning to go out and do their job yeah. of what it was to do. You know, uh, Korea was an artillery war. But I had a Vietnam veteran on a while back, and and he was talking about Vietnam was a small arms war. He was talking about the, all the firepower. Mm -hmm. I what I my part of it, it was not small arms. It was it was big stuff. We had a bomb. <laughs> A thousand pound bomb, if you can imagine, a thousand pound bomb, and it had a fuse. We uh, you put a fuse, all bombs have fuses on them. This bomb had a fuse we called the daisy cutter. The daisy cutter was a 36 inch fuse, would go off. In other words, when you drop the bomb, it will go off 36 inches above the ground, okay. and it will literally yeah. obliterate anything. It's, it's a, it just spreads. Yeah, it goes uh, sideways, doesn't it? It just goes right out because it goes off 36 inches above the ground. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it was used to make helicopter landing pads because you could take a thousand pound bomb, put a daisy cutter fuse on it and drop it and it would go off. It would just obliterate the trees, just peel them right out. Just yeah. make a nice clearing there. Right, right. make a good clearing. <laughs> yeah. But you could use various types of fuses on your bombs. Oh yeah, sure. Well, you know, one of the things the military guys do is hit the ground so everything goes above them. So, but in the case of a daisy cutter, <laughs> that was no protection hitting the ground, was it? I had one thing humorous. Uh, one of my nights off, I knew the difference between incoming artillery and incoming fire and outgoing fire when it mm -hmm. comes to naval gunfire or artillery. Yeah. Uh, the ships would set out in the harbor 
at night, and they would fire over the top of targets that they had. We'd fire over the places we were sleeping in. And uh, oh, I think it was, I was there about a month, and the Navy started letting some stuff go about 3 o'clock in the morning. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, the sirens went off. When they get incoming, the sirens goes off to wake you up and get you in your bunker. I, I woke up and I knew what it was. I knew it was a Navy was firing over the top of us, and I knew it was outgoing. It wasn't incoming. And they didn't like it very well, the guys in there, because I stood there and laughed at them because they were all running out. And they had all had white shorts on, white skimmies on, and they were flying out that door past yeah. the cat heading for the bunker, and I'm standing there laughing at them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it was, it was uh, naval gunfire is what it was. Yeah. It wasn't incoming. They didn't like it very well because yeah. I stood there and had a good time over it. But you had the experience and they didn't, right? right? Yeah. I knew what it was. <laughs> I, I see that happen in Korea. There was a, one of our batteries right behind us and shot over our heads. Some guy that I met on ship happened to, he was on the front line, but he stopped where I was and was talking. And the, <laughs> the gun behind us fired and the, the ring, the brass ring was loose on it. And oh. you should have heard the whistle on that. He hit the ground and the rest of us stood there and kind of laughed at him and embarrassed the heck out of him. But okay. Now I lived a lot better in Vietnam uh, as far as living and eating because uh, the, in Vietnam, being in aviation, why uh, we had our beds and we had our hot meals three times a day. Yeah. Uh, sure, you was on base. It was, yeah, it was a completely different situation for me as it was the first one. Right. Yeah, and look at them today. Right. <laughs> they go down to McDonald's or Burger Chef or someplace yeah. like that after their whatever. It was quite, yeah. a, quite a different, <clears throat> quite a different experience uh, between the two of them. And I was fortunate to be able to do both because a lot of guys, when they go in, they stay in for 20, 22 years, they stay in and do the same job for Every all day. that period of time. But sure. I, I, had a, I was fortunate, I, had, I got to see everything about the Marine Corps and how they operated, which very few people ever got to do. Because mm -hmm. I, like I say, I started out as a Ford observer and I was interested in being in the infantry. So I went to the infantry for a few years and then I wanted to work on aircraft, be around aircraft, so I got to work on aircraft. So I had, my 22 years was outstanding career. You actually done some uh, schooling too, didn't you? Uh, teaching? I was an instructor for three years on that aircraft, the A4D Douglas Skyhawk. Uh, I was an instructor to enlisted and I taught pilots emergency procedures. Uh, I had a, what to call a cockpit orientation trainer. It's an exact setup of the aircraft cockpit, everything works in it, and then I had a big panel that I sat at, and I could give the pilot failures. I could give him uh, an electrical failure. Uh, if he did the right thing, he could regain his uh, electrical power. Uh, in A4, he had a handle to pull, and when he pulled this handle, we call the emergency generator would flop out the side, and the emergency generator had a little propeller on it, which this propeller turned and allowed him to get the electrical power for the essential things that he needed for the aircraft. Yeah. I could also give him a flame out. When a flame out goes out, you're in trouble because you don't go nowhere when the engine ain't got no, no fire. So I could give him a uh, flame out. If he uh, restarted the aircraft in the proper procedure, he could get the aircraft going again. Uh, I could give him hydraulic failures and if he reacted properly to that, uh, then you could uh, correct everything in the cockpit. But that's one of the jobs I had. And I also taught, uh, enlisted the aircraft, and I also taught pilots about the aircraft who had, uh, were just starting out with the aircraft. Yeah. One incident I had, uh, a major that I worked for called me in one day and he says, uh, I have a general that's going to fly this airplane for the first time. He said, I want you to go down to the squadron where he's going to fly out of, and I want you to give him a class. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, it's bad enough to give a one-man class, but to sit out there and have a one-star general sitting there staring at you all the time, and you're trying to stand up there and, and give him, tell him what to do, and you know he's going to go out and fly that airplane, and you know you better be right with what you well, tell him. That creates a little anxiety. You're in serious trouble if you tell him something wrong. I mean, one-star general will get right down on your back and eat you alive is what he'll do. Yeah. So I stood there and sweated the whole time he was up flying that airplane, and he'd come back. That was... 
that was my. But he was already a pilot, right? He so was a he pilot. was transitioning from Into one that, yes. type of aircraft to another. Right. Right. So you taught him the nuances right. of that particular aircraft. Uh -huh. But you know, your training there was invaluable to a good many pilots, probably. Oh yes. You might have actually saved some lives. I had a good story. Uh, the A4 come out a trainer with with two seats, and. Uh, I had pilots to come up and and I would mess with them when I when I run the cockpit orientation trainer with them I would give them multiple failures you know and that kind of stuff. And then they got the two seater which allowed them to take pass uh, somebody else up, and uh, they asked me he said uh, why don't you come up and fly with us? Well I, well, I, I was uh, well I'd, I'd like to do that, and so I had to go through ejection seat training and I had to go through uh, uh, pressure chambers and various things in order to be able to do this and I got to thinking about it it was always the second lieutenants that wanted to take me up and fly oh, yeah and I became suspicious because the second lieutenants are always the ones I mess with with the, when I get in their <laughs> training and I figured this was payback time and I knew that if I got in the back seat of that plane with that oxygen mask fitting tight on your face and they got me up there and they started doing some of their squirrely stuff they do with them I knew what was going to happen my system was never going to take it. <laughs> and I told him, no, I don't think I want to do this. <laughs> I talked to a Navy pilot, took off from Carrier. He said he could take off Carrier, do a turn, put the guy in the second seat to sleep, just like that. Right, yeah. You pull enough G's, pull enough gravity. Yep. And the second seat was off center of gravity because the pilot sits on the center. He has to because of all these turns and everything going on. And he could, he could just put the guy in the second seat to sleep. And that, what you're telling me uh, about being in the second seat. I would not uh, they, they would have, how you say, payback. If one of the majors or colonels invited me to go up, I'd have probably went, because they had a little more sense than second lieutenants. <laughs> right, okay. One thing I didn't mention, Carl, but, uh, John was on the Noble County Sheriff's Department for 19 yeah, years. Yeah, he told me that. And he uh, was, I believe, second in command. He I was, was captain. Chief, chief deputy for a chief. while. For a while, now he retired as a captain. Yeah. And so you had quite a life of service. I did. And uh, boy, I, I appreciate that, John. I really do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, served his country and his community. Right. Yeah. I also didn't mention that. He lives in Florida, him and his wife, Carol, just come down for a visit. He was on one of the other programs about three years ago. Oh, okay. And I thought sure. that was the opportunity to get him on the, the American Veteran Program. Well, you have quite a story to tell. Like I say, I, I enjoy hearing it uh, because I have some inkling of what you've been going through. Um, that creates respect. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you got back from Vietnam, did you, anybody ever give you any hard time? No, uh, best they didn't. Yeah. I would have <laughs> took yeah. it kindly. I had did have one relative uh, uh, in the background, uh, so I could hear it. To not know how many babies I killed. Yeah, but yeah. I don't pay. I never paid attention. It irritated me and. It made me angry, uh, but uh, he just considered the source and he just let it go. Yeah. Well, like, that, that kind of person has never experienced I, military We did life. what we were supposed to do, and that's, that's, that's right. the way it is. I was a career Marine, and that was my job, and it was not me to question why or anything else. It was my job to go do what they told me to do. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. I'd like to hear more. We're out of time already. Appreciate you both being here. If you enjoyed the program, we're on every Friday night at 7.30, uh, so be sure to tune in and tell your friends. Uh, just remember, freedom is not free. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>